Welcome um, to the final uh, event of the Food Film Festival, the fourth edition of the Food Film Festival. Um, we have had an amazing uh, fourth edition of the Food Film Festival for the first time here in, uh, at the Western Gasfabriek. We've seen three days of amazing films, workshops, uh, a big debate on fisheries. Everyone who's working here is kind of walking uh, uh, very, very tired from, from, a, lo from a lot of work uh, for the last couple of uh, weeks, but we can be very proud of what we have done. Great workshops, films, full, ha full house. <coughs> and of course, the amazing weather was really something that <laughs> made this edition <laughs> some edition to never forget. Um, my name is uh, Joris Lohmann. I'm uh, one of the founders of the Food Film Festival, and I'm uh, the director of the Youth Food Movement. Um, we're a network of young people that try to um, change the world through food uh, on the basis of the ideals of slow food. And we uh, actually, the Food Film Festival is um, our um, annual event where we try to bring people, all kinds of people together that um, are working towards uh, a more just and sustainable food system. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really happy that uh, I have the honor to announce our keynote speaker uh, of, the, uh, of, uh, of this, this year's edition. Mr. Joel Saladin, Saladin, <laughs> Saladin, sorry, <laughs> I, ju I just checked it. Um, Mr. Uh, Saladin has been uh, on a tour uh, through Holland, actually. Um, we've been kind of pushing him as uh, the rock star farmer, but I think he ha actually felt like a rock star the last couple of days because he's been around, he's been interviewed by m most of the big media in the, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, we are really, really proud to have him here, not only because he was once uh, named as uh, the world's most innovative farmer by Time magazine, uh, but also personally, actually, um, and this is something that uh, I haven't told you, uh, Mr. Salatin yet, but uh, I think one, not the only, but a big reason of, uh, that we're all here together and that the Food Film Festival exists is because um, Mr. Salatin exists. Uh, because actually four years ago when we were thinking about this festival, when we just started with the youth food movement, um, I uh, read a book, um, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan, and this is where I think a lot of people also know uh, Mr. Salatin from. And I was very inspired by, uh, well, the, the way he, he, he looks at farming and he has this entirely different idea um, uh, of, of, of how to run a farm. Uh, against all, let's say, odds of the current modernized food system. Uh, and also, um, we decided to organize a food film festival because uh, in the film Food Inc., he plays a very uh, important role. So I think he's one of the most uh, people that inspired us most to start doing what we're doing today. So I think it's very special and, um, uh, well, let's say, uh, amazing that um, we have the honor to uh, host him today as our uh, keynote speaker. I would ask you to give a very big hand of applause for Mr. Joe Saladin. Well, it's a delight to be with you this evening. It's an honor to be here in Amsterdam. Um, uh, this is the capstone of a 16-day 16-day um, uh, multi-continental speaking tour for me. So uh, if I sound a little bit hoarse, I've been putting a lot of words together for the last few days. So I apologize for that hoarseness, but we will have a great time, and um, and we will we will see some uh, pretty pictures, and I think be encouraged and challenged. What I want to do is start with uh, a kind of a, a context of our farm in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, which is on the east, eastern part of the U.S. And then we will finish with trying to answer the question, so how can I participate in this? That's the big question. What can I do? You know, a lot of people want to participate, want to help, want to, uh, how can I move this agenda forward? And so we will conclude with some real practical action things that, um, that people can do in the urban sector, the suburban sector, the rural sector, any sector, to participate in what I call the integrity food tsunami. So 
let's have the first. I don't have a clicker, so we're going to we're going to try to you know mm, mm, you know make make this thing happen. So we will go through. Um, so let's have a first image here, and um, we'll get started. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about farming, and uh, just to set the context, our farm doesn't take any subsidies, not from the U.S. government, not from the EU, not from anybody, all right? It's a self-sustaining, entrepreneurial, uh, lunatic farm, all right? Certified lunatic, and uh, I am the number one lunatic. Go ahead, next. And so we... Um, we really commune with our animals. You know, we, we don't see uh, our farm and our, the nest that we live in as being a, a, an, an enemy that we have to, we have to wrestle and, and, and fight and make produce something for me. I'm going to make you produce. No, At, rather, our nest is a loving friend that we caress like a lover. It is not a scarce, reluctant partner. It is an abundant, joyful partner. And so our role in this is not as a manipulator, but as a masseuse of this ecological womb and the dependent umbilical that ties us all to the nest. Next slide. <clears throat> It's all beautiful. You know, farms should be aesthetically and aromatically, sensually romantic. If it stinks, it's not good farming. How do you know when food is spoiled? How do you know when something is not good? It smells bad. It looks ugly. Good farming should smell good and be beautiful to the eyes. If you have to walk through sheep dip, put on a hazardous material suit, and sign in and sign out, that might not be food you want to eat. And so we want inviting farms, places of beauty that people are invited to go to, and you don't have to worry about bringing diseases. Go ahead. So when you come and visit us, that's our house built in 1780, so it's a little bit old. It's a log cabin. Um, I know it doesn't look like a log cabin, but it is a log cabin. Um, I mean, covered up. That's how they preserve them, you know. The idea of the, did you know this, that the, 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 the log cabin, you know, uh, the only ones that survived were the ones that got covered up with clapboard quickly. Uh, if they didn't get covered up with clapboard, they, 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 de they composted, all right? So, um, the family that built our house, not related to us, but apparently they got enough money early enough to cover it up with a clapboard and save the logs. But this is considered bioterrorism in the United States. And um, because these chickens are unvaccinated, unmedicated, unadulterated, unprostituted, un, you know, they're just chickens. And they're out running on the pasture where they may uh, intersect with a robin or an indigo bunting or, um, or, or some other bird who then takes our diseases to the science-based confinement factory, concentration camp, chicken houses, and make them all sick and threaten the planet's food supply and destroy the world population all because we were so negligent as to let unmedicated chickens run in the open. <clears throat> That's the truth. You know, people say, how do your neighbors intersect with you? Well, the neighbors that aren't farming love us. The neighbors that are farming hate us. There's an orthodoxy of our day. And I think it's important for us to understand that the orthodoxy of our day is not pastured, chicken-friendly production. These chickens are free to express their chickenness. And we think that expressing their chickenness is foundational to holding a culture in a place where it respects the Tomness of Tom and the merriness of Mary. We are clever enough. We're humans. We have a big brain and opposing thumbs, you know. We're clever enough to invent schemes and invent 
systems that we can't ethically, physically, spiritually, morally, or emotionally metabolize. And so we invent things like confinement houses with drugs and pharmaceuticals that make MRSA and C. diff and Campylobacter and Listeria and E. coli and entire language of Latin words that we've all learned to say in the last few years that we never heard when I was growing up. And this is nature's language crying out to us in our time, begging us, enough! Rape, pillage, and conquistador mentality. And so I submit that the foundation of an ethical society, of a moral culture, is a moral compass toward how we view life. Life is not just mechanical. We live in a time where people think the orthodoxy of our day is that life is fundamentally mechanical. But life is fundamentally biological. You know, that's how farmers like me were treated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, I call it the U.S. duh. To free dinners for 40 years to teach us how to feed dead cows to cows. When we didn't embrace this new science, this progressive thinking, we were branded as Luddites, barbarians, Neanderthals, anti-science, non-progressive. Forty years later, with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, that's a big word, otherwise known as mad cow, suddenly there was this big global, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to have done that. We did not embrace that, not because we didn't like science, not because we didn't like the U.S. duh, although there's no love lost there, not because we were anti-progress, but because we looked around the globe to find an herbivore that eats carrion and couldn't find one. And that became an ethical boundary around our cleverness and we realized we can't go there because nature doesn't go there. And so we let the templates and patterns of nature guide our thought process, guide our creativity. Otherwise, science moves amorally into whatever we can conceive, and we conceive things that destroy us. And then we spend the next generations trying to remediate the damage we've caused. And so if we just stay with the pattern to start with, we don't have all that extra work to do. Next slide. <clears throat> so we run poultry out on pasture, all right? And these, these shelters get moved every day. There are no flies, no odors. This can be done in a backyard. And it's scalable. It works just as well with a large farm. It works just as well with one shelter in a backyard. And we believe that's one of the truths of, of, of agricultural truth is when a model can scale up as well as down. If it only scales up, it's very exclusive to a fraternity of industrialists. If it only scales down, it's just cute and fuzzy and doesn't really feed the world. So we need models that scale up as well as down. Next slide. <clears throat> These are the eggmobiles. They follow the cows in the pasture rotation. The chickens free range out from them, eat the fly larvae out of the cow pies. You know, to talk to the average cattle person today, the guy growing cows, dairy, or whatever, you wonder... How in the world did we ever survive until Merck Pharmaceuticals and Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson developed grubicides, parasiticides, and, and uh, all sorts of things that end in the Latin suffix C-I-D-E, which means death? Why is it 
that our life-giving food is supposed to be liberally baptized. That's a good word for the Dutch. Baptized with C-I-D-E. That's nuts. Next slide. So we move these with the cows and the chickens scratch through the larvae. Go ahead. And eat the bugs out. We run pigs through the woods. Pigs outside? Who ever heard of pigs outside? You see, nature loves periodic disturbance. Did you know that? We have this idea today that nature is so sacred. Um, we, we all carry around a guilt complex, and I get that. I understand, because much of our history is destroying nature. And so what happens is we're, we're so afraid to, to touch nature because, oh, you know, all of our history and our, our environmental sciences courses show us that the human touch to nature more often than not is, is destructive. And so, oh, oh, oh I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I can't participate in nature. And so we, we abandon nature. So I look in the mirror at my big brain and my opposing thumbs and I said, so why am I endowed with these abilities? Is it so that I can be an inherently more efficient earth rapist? Or is it possible that my mandate is to use this big brain and opposing thumbs to participate in this ecological womb as a healer, a nurturer? And do it cleverly. And so we use high-tech electric fencing and pigs as a disturbance tool to come in, next slide, and, and change that forestal ecosystem to grow more plants in the, in the uh, bottom of it. So all the animals are outside. They're not locked up inside. They're, they're, they're able to be out where they can get bugs and grass and exercise and fresh air. You know, these confinement houses are amazing things. Um, if you ever walk in one, you'll notice very clear clearly that uh, you're starting to choke because of the ammonia. Well, think about the animal that lives in that. I mean, you know, many of them are only a, a, a foot off the ground, their noses. And so this house makes fecal Fecal particulate. I'm going to slow down when I think I might need you to take some more time to translate. Um, like manure dust. Okay? Manure dust. And it's like sandpaper. And so this manure dust goes in the nostrils of the chicken or the pig or the cow or whatever. And they breathe it in, and it's like sandpaper on the mucus, tender mucus membranes of the respiratory system. And it rubs the, rest, the, the, the mucus membranes and makes lesions and wounds that then bleed so that the dust can go into the bloodstream and infect the animal with diseases. And so now we get to use drugs and pharmaceuticals to keep the animal healthy, to keep the infections down because of the manure dust. Next slide. <clears throat> we like our animals to work with us. So we do a lot of large-scale composting. Um, this is a fundamentally carbon-centric farm. You know, we have this notion that the soil is an inert uh, material uh, that just holds up plants and we intravenous, you know, the soil and the plants with, with uh, straight shots of some sort of manure or fertilizer or whatever. But, you know, nature doesn't put material in the ground the soil likes to be fed on top of its head. Nature doesn't till material. It doesn't, it doesn't knife manure into the ground. It puts brown stuff on top. And so we run our farm with compost. Fundamentally a carbon-centric system. But compost is expensive to handle, expensive to make, expensive to do. So how do we do it? 
you know, compost needs to be turned and, and aerated and all that. So we use pig aerators. Pig aerators. Like aerobic dance, you know, like, okay. Aerators. And when we feed the cows hay, we feed them in, in, the, in the hay shed here and let this big carbonaceous diaper filled up behind them. And we put corn in it. And the corn ferments in this anaerobic bedding pack that the cows are tromping out the oxygen from. Then when the cows come out, we have this deep, impregnated, wonderful, fermented pack of carbon, nutrients, and corn. And then we put the pigs in, and the pigs then seek the corn. If you've ever looked closely, all pigs have a sign on their forehead, we'll work for corn. And the pigs then seek the fermented corn and use the plow on the end of their nose to actually find the corn, aerate the compost, and convert it from anaerobic to aerobic without any machines or petroleum or our time, and the animals do the work. Suddenly, the animals are not just, they're not just bacon or ham or, 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 or pork chops. Now, they are fellow laborers, co-laborers in this great land healing ministry. And it suddenly completely changes our relationship with them. And it allows them to fully express their pigness. So the idea is to create a habitat that, capital, that, that, that leverages the natural talents, gifts, and assets of each plant and animal. Next slide. And this compost, it, it gets kind of like, um, you know, Macbeth with the witch's brew, you know, and, their, and the eye of newt and all that. The steam comes off of this wonderful uh, compost. And then we spread that back out on the fields. And in 53 years, we have never bought a single bag of chemical fertilizer or an ounce of pesticide or herbicide. And this is the this is the foundation of our fertility program. It is soil building. You see, soil is alive. This is alive. I don't understand why uh, chemical fertilizer is so attractive to people. Um, I mean, it's almost as if chemical fertilizer is more, um, uh, is more sexy than compost piles. But I would suggest there's a lot more sex in a compost pile than in a bag of 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizer. What we're looking at is life. You know, if you, if you look at the soil at a, in, a, in an electron microscope, you know, you'll see a, a four-legged kind of cow-looking thing walk along, you know. And, um, thank you. And this, and this, uh, and this, and, you know, he's, he's grazing on, Grazing on uh, little hypha and mycelium and, you know, these little microscopic, I mean, they're, they're, they're microns in, in, in across, you know. Um, they're, they're, they're ten times thinner than a human hair, okay, and he's grazing on this stuff. All of a sudden, from ten o'clock, runs in a six-legged um, uh, narwhal-looking thing with a spear on his head, and he pokes that spear into the aqueous body of the, you know, the four-legged cow-looking thing and, and, and sucks out all that aqueous juice, juice flies, and you're looking at the electron, whoa, wow, what is this, you know? Talk about a movie, you know? And, 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 and you're scarcely recovered when from 2 o'clock comes running in a 12-legged centipede-looking thing with, with uh, shears on his head. He comes up to the bloop, bloop, bloop thing, you know, who's now kind of, you know, starting to, uh, yeah, and, and clops off his head and, and eats it all up. And this all happens in the course of like half of a second, and it happens billions and billions and billions of time, times a day, and all of that eating, being eaten, life, death, decomposition, regeneration keeps us alive. How many times do we think about it? When you took your shower before you came tonight, oh, 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 yeah. did you think about the earthworms? Did you think about the mycelium, the hyphae, the azobacters? 
the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes. The more beings in a handful of earth than there are people on the face of the earth. In a handful of dirt. handful of dirt than there are people on the face of the earth. That's a lot of life. That's a community of beings. That each of us has the privilege to participate in every time we take a bite of food. Because each of us has three trillion beings inside of us. Massachusetts Institute of Technology has now shown that you and I are only 15% human. We're 85% non-human. And these bacteria are talking to each other. We now have isolated some of their linguistic uh, styles. And so when we eat food that is full of compatible life, they commune. Hi, cousin carrot. You know. But these inside of us, they don't know what monosodium glutamate is. They don't know what unpronounceable red dye 29 is. High steroid, styroid, you know, Five chemical unpronounceable things. That's a foreign substance. And they don't know what it is. So what we want to do is commune our internal organisms with the soil. Ultimately, our eating should build soil. And we should patronize farmers who ultimately are building soil and taking care of this amazing invisible community upon which every, every one of us depends. That's our ultimate connection to this umbilical. Next slide. <clears throat> and then the pigs come out onto pig pasture. Next slide. And we move them every few days to another pasture. The whole idea here is movement. They disturb over here, they eat over here, in, in five days this one will look like this, and in 50 days this one will look like this. That disturbance rest, disturbance rest is ecological exercise, and it responds to our participation with it. Next slide. So that as the pigs go through and freshen up and exercise the soil, suddenly all these latent plants, seeds in the soil that have been ungerminated for hundreds of years sprout, exploding, and give us a magnificent understory of succulent vegetation to intercept sunbeams and convert sunbeams into biomass. You see, I think it's fascinating that sunbeams, as esoteric and mystical as they are, are converted by photosynthesis into something that you can feel, touch, weigh, and hand together. Forage, biomass, is 95% sunlight and only 5% soil. The earth is on a weight gain program. And our farming and eating can help in that conversion of solar energy into biomass. That is what sequesters carbon. That is what purifies the air, transpires and keeps the rain cycles up, which maybe some of you are thinking maybe we don't need enough of this biomass here. Um, but most of the parts of the world are desperate for transpirational, evaporative condensation. You're in a very unusual place. This is the first country I've ever visited in which nobody is interested in water. <laughs> but believe me, if you travel very far, you will encounter the single biggest need is hydration in a time of desertification. Go ahead. And it's delightful. You know, you can work in this kind of environment. Notice there's very little concrete. 
overhead. Pretty simple. Go ahead. <clears throat> so we, um, we work with life. And life is majestic, awesome, and a privilege to be a part of. Go ahead, next slide. What are herbivores for? To melt the polar caps? Like the UN Long Shadow Report says. No, the reason for herbivores is to prune the biomass. See, biomass grows in a sigmoid curve, a, an S curve. I call this down here diaper grass, teenage grass, nursing home grass. Okay? Starts growing slowly, grows fast, and then slows down again, and then gradually goes into senescence. So just like a viticulturalist would prune a vineyard, or like an orchardist would prune an apple tree, we don't, we don't say they're destroying the planet because they're pruning an apple tree or pruning a vi an orchard. The herbivore is the biomass pruner to restart the rapid Biomass accumulation cycle. That's what they're for. The damage that they've caused is not their fault, it's their manager's fault. So don't blame the cow for problems. And trust me, all of the scientific reports you see about the cow, about the herbivore, are based on what is currently happening, which is overgrazing or undergrazing or grain-based programs rather than the herbivore eating grass. The herbivore is actually a four-legged portable sauerkraut vat. She takes in biomass, ferments it, and turns it into nutrient-dense product, dairy, meat, whatever. But that can only happen and only happen ecologically uh, uh, helpfully if it's forage, if it's perennials, rather than annuals and grain. And all the reports that you see right now are based on a grain-based, annual-based, tillage-based agriculture. The second we move to a perennially-based, diversified, non-tillage, perennial system, like nature intended, all the scientific findings are false. All of them. And we can produce more product this way than we can using annuals, tillage, and, and, and fertilizers. Next slide. So it's our responsibility to mimic the way herbivores and perennials have built soil throughout the histories. That has, soil has not been built by putting animals in confinement houses. Soil has not been built by feeding herbivores grain or dead herbivores. Soil is built with the pruning of herbivores and constantly moving in a mob to protect them from predators and mowing. That's what the herbivore is for. That's why there's so many of them all around the planet. You know, alpacas, llamas, guinea pigs, wildebeest, giraffes, zebras, water buffalo, um, um, uh, yaks. I'm going kind of around the planet, you know. Uh, reindeer, okay, and, 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 and bison and antelope and elk. And the, the planet is full of herbivores. Why? Because grass, not grain, grass, perennial grass, is the most efficient converter of solar energy into biomass and carbon sequestration. But all of that beautiful blessing of herbivorous perennial soil building structure is destroyed when we move it to an anti-ecological, grain-based, annual-based, tillage-based, chemical-based, confinement animal feeding-based operation. Next slide. They get real friendly, too. So this is the mob. So we move them. We move them every day to a new spot, okay? They don't stay on one place. They don't continuously graze. We're mimicking nature like this. And so every day they get moved to a fresh salad bar. No more than you would like to stay uh, you know, on, on the same salad bar all day. Neither do the cows. 
And so they get moved to a fresh salad bar every day. So they're only on one spot maybe, you know, uh, three times a year. Go ahead. Next slide. So we do what we call mob stocking, herbivorous, solar conversion, lignified carbon, sequestration, fertilization. This is 350 head on one hectare a day. And this greatly increases the productive capacity so that our, our, our production is five times our county average. And we haven't bought a bag of chemical fertilizer in over 50 years. Beautifully, you don't have to sacrifice the ecology to make economic sense. See, this is the great lie of our time, that in order to be economical, we have to sacrifice the ecology. And in order to have ecology correct, we've got to sacrifice the economy. That's not true. But you can't, you can't make that happen with, with little 10-degree deviations from industrial food production. You have to make 180-degree deviation. It's not just changing to organic by feeding organic grain to cows and organic grain to pigs in confinement situations. It's eliminating the confinement situations, eliminating the grain to herbivores. That's the way you actually make the change. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there they are, um, 350 spread out on, on one hectare for one day. So tomorrow they'll go into the next spot. And they just, like a mowing machine, they just, they just move right along to the next spot. And they get really friendly when they do this. You know, if every day at 4 o'clock somebody called you for a bowl of ice cream, you'd learn to come real easy too. Moving them is not a big deal. Um, they just come when you call. Next slide. They get really docile. So, um, so the egg mobiles follow the cows, the chickens lay the eggs as a byproduct of pasture sanitation. We go out and gather the eggs and bring them in. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the Millennium Feather Net. All right, this is another model that we do that's pastured poultry. This netting is really um, high-tech science-based. Uh, you know, it uses computer microchip energizers. It's a portable netting that keeps foxes and foxes and coyotes and bears and possums and raccoons out. Keeps the chickens in. 50 meters weighs only about uh, uh, 8 kilograms. And you can put it up and take it down in 10 minutes. Who would have thunk? This is an information-based idea. You know, uh, Kevin Kelly, the editor of Wired Magazine, says one of the elements or, or the elements of, um, of, of the information age is it's downsized, restructured, and... Um, um, miniaturized, you know, like the, the 120 secret pound secretary has been replaced by a four ounce mail router. And so now what we have are very lightweight, information dense infrastructures to be able to create a portable farm. For the first time in human history, we can run large scale domestic stock on pasture in a way that builds soil, honors the animalness of, of, you know, the particularness of that animal and moves it uh, around in the fresh air and sunshine and it's gorgeous. Yes, next picture. This is up inside of it. Um, this is quite a choir loft. Uh, when you go in here, uh, it's quite a choir loft. But you can see the birds um, laying there and, and, and being their chicken selves. Yes, go ahead. In the winter, during inclement weather, and we do get usually close to a meter of snow every winter, and uh, it gets pretty cold. Well, then they come in to hoop houses, tall, tall tunnels, so that they can stay nice and warm. And pigs underneath, go ahead. And multi-speciation, then when they come out in the spring, we clean out that compost bedding, that debug bedding, and we can plant vegetables and plants in the greenhouses to use them for multiple use and multiple things. So we're not interested, I hope by now you're understanding, we're not interested in monospeciation. That's another, that's another uh, a foundational point of current you know, industrial food production is monospeciation. No, nature's not monospeciated, it's multi-speciated. Okay, next picture. <clears throat> Rabbits, yeah, they're out on pasture too. Next picture. Next picture. See the picture of the 
birds, we, we move these every day, okay, every day to a fresh salad bar. The chickens just walk up the pasture to the next spot. Very efficient. One person can move 60 of these in an hour. It's very, very efficient. Go ahead, next picture. Turkeys. Gobble, gobble. Okay, turkeys. Uh, they're in this netting as well. Simple structure. Next picture. Uh, turkeys are pretty cool. They're, they're, um, they're not the brightest thing in the world. But boy, do they like grass and do they like to walk. And so they're out on pasture as well. Go ahead, next picture. And um, uh, like the uh, other uh, turkeys that we elect to political office, these turkeys do stump speeches and all sorts of political campaigns. Oh, uh, this is, th there's, there's a stump under here. It's, it's hard to see, but this one's standing on a stump. Okay, go ahead. That one kind of missed for you. <laughs> and so what this is about is creating integrity food. Food that has the right balance of omega-3, omega-6 acid. The, the fatty acid profile is right. The polyunsaturated fat profile is right. The riboflavin, flovic, um, folic acid, you know, vitamins A, D, E, all of those things are right. Okay, that's the idea. It's not about how fast can we grow it, how big can we grow it. You know, our idea is how can we grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper. Well, we all know that that can't be very sacred or healthy. That's why the average NFL football player is dead at 57. Because when your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freak of nature and nature weeds you out. Next picture. <clears throat> the most important thing that we're doing now on our farm is germinating young farmers. This is one of our former apprentices who started a raw milk herd share dairy. And we helped him get started. He's now completely on his own and functioning. And we've done this over and over again with these wonderful young people. Next picture. To get them started. Here's another one that started his horticulture business at our place. He's now moved on to his own farming. Go ahead. <clears throat> Some of his wonderful garden produce. Go ahead. More of it. Go ahead. Shiitake mushrooms. He wanted to start those. So now what we've done is we're using our intern apprenticeship program to vet young people who can come to us so that rather than having employees, they bring their proposals, their farm fit proposals, and we can leverage our machinery, our experience, our customer base, on these new young farmers so they can create their own kingdoms. Everybody wants a kingdom, right? So they can create their own kingdoms and carve out their own businesses into our program. And this germinates these young farmers. Go ahead. <clears throat> We're very open. We invite any of you to come to the farm. We have a 24-7, 365 open door policy. Anyone may come from anywhere in the world, anytime, to see anything, anywhere, unannounced. That's our commitment to transparency. Does the food you ate today have that level of transparency? We believe that local food systems provide a short enough chain of custody between field and fork to allow people to see their food. And that is the foundation of integrity. You can't have integrity when you can't see it. And when you don't have transparency, what happens is people start making shortcuts. So we enjoy people coming to the farm. Go ahead. We do school tours as well. Go ahead. For urban young people to come to the farm. This is another one of our interns. She said, I want to stay. I said, well, what do you want to do? How are you going to earn a living? She said, I'd like to start a school tour program. So she developed her own business, Grass Stains Tours. Okay. So rather than us having all the ideas, we want to provide a germination tray for young people to be able to begin their farming careers on their own incentive. Go ahead. We do a lot of food fairs, and uh, one of our favorite things is cooking uh, sausage, putting it on a toothpick and handing it as a sample to the children of vegetarians. <laughs> 
We love our vegetarian customers. You know, when they find out the best way to sequester carbon and heal the planet is with perennial pasture-based portable livestock, they have to binge to make up for lost time. So it's really fun. Go ahead. This is in the city where our Metropolitan Buying Club customers are lining up to get their food from their farmer. So we service about 5,000 families, 50 restaurants, several boutique retail outlets, directly from the farm, working with other farmers and creating this vital link, a short chain of custody right into the urban sector. We find that there are a lot of people ready to participate in the local food, integrity food movement, and we give them that bridge to participate. Go ahead. It's all about the young people. It's all about the next generation. And I can't tell you what a joy it is in my life at this stage to be surrounded by what we call bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, self-starter entrepreneurs. And to germinate those young people into their dreams. Next picture. Is that the, that's the last one? That's a good one. That's a good one to end on. Okay, so, so uh, that's a context of what we do at our farm our time light. Good. Okay. Now we'll answer the question in about 10 minutes. How can I participate in this? Did, did this touch your heart? Say, yeah, I want to I wanna be a part of that. All right. So on our farm, I told you we supply about 50 restaurants and 5,000 customers. So we've kind of created our, 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 our model customer. So I want to describe the perfect customer, the perfect urban food participant. Okay? You ready? All right. Here's the perfect urban food participant. First of all, it's a person that loves to be in their kitchen. You know, we live in an interesting time. In no time in human history have we had more techno glitzy gadgets in our kitchen. I mean, we've got Cuisinarts, we've got timed bake, I mean, we've got indoor plumbing. Hot and cold. I'm not talking about barefoot pregnant in the kitchen with a hoop skirt and hearth cooking, as romantic as that might sound to somebody. I'm talking about using the most sophisticated stuff that we have. Bread makers, ovens, refrigerators, stainless steel, cheese graters. I mean, we got everything, but we've never been more lost as to how to use it. We need people who are as excited about getting in their kitchens and participating with their food, preparing, processing, packaging, and preserving their food as they are the latest belly button piercing in celebrity culture. Put down People magazine. Put down the celebrity whatever. Turn off the TV and enjoy the kitchen with your kids. It's chemistry. It's math. You know, a quarter of this and a half that and double this. And it's great for all these wonderful things. Throw the iPad out the door. Throw the video games out the door. And involve your kids in the kitchen and make food fun, educational, information, and tasty. Okay? So what we're definitely after is somebody that loves to be in their kitchen that participates with their food. So you know the nuances of taste and texture. You know, we live in a time when people don't know anything about food. I mean, our customers call us and say, if I thaw the chicken in the sink, will it get sick? No, it won't get sick. It'll be fine. Um, 30 years, all of our customers are women. I, I guess you realize that. You know, 90% of all food decisions are made by women. So we don't have any men customers. You know, men, men just open the refrigerator, look in, and say, honey, I can't find it. You know, close. that's all men do. Did you know that just 40 years ago, you couldn't get a boneless, skinless breast? Chicken. You couldn't get it. If you wanted a boneless, skinless breast, you had to go buy the chicken and take a knife. Imagine. A knife. 
and cut it out. Today, 50% of our customers don't even know a chicken has bones. I mean, you have to explain to them that a, that a chicken nugget in the form of Dino the dinosaur is not a muscle group on a chicken. And so we need people that are excited about their kitchens and about the techno-glitzy gadgets that they've got and getting involved with their kitchens. Next, we need people who, are, who, are, um, who value paying for integrity food and don't complain about every penny spent on food. We need people who are adamantly opposed to a cheap food policy. Because a cheap food policy gets us environmental shortcuts. It gets us nutritional deficiency. What is it? Oh, uh, um, you mean you mean a cheap food, cheap food, a cheap food policy. In other words, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, if anything doesn't make translation here, you just stop me. I'm almost done. Um, cheap food, <laughs> cheap food policy. In other words, this is this is a, a universal orthodoxy that food should be cheap. We've even got this idea that. Farmers should be uh, uh, the poorest people on the block. You know, I ask urban white collar professionals, what would you think if your farmer showed up driving a Mercedes Benz? Would you be thrilled or would you say, huh, that guy gouging me with food prices? You know, we wouldn't think twice about a surgeon showing up in a Mercedes Benz. What about a farmer? And that's why I espouse the agrarian literate. Why are farmers supposed to be the off scouring of society? Dark skinned people. Ooh. I just talked to some farmers today, and they told me that the universal language of farmers in Europe is to moan. All you have to do is learn how to moan and moan louder and longer, and the government will come with a subsidy to take care of you. You just have to learn to moan. This has been created, gentle people, by our universal disaffection for honoring the most sacred vocation, the, the, the stewards of our air, soil, and water. If you ever wondered why our farmland is not being better stewarded, perhaps it's because we aren't willing to invest in food prices that create a literate, well-bred, best and brightest, most creative, entrepreneurial farming steward sector. And so I push our urban clients and anyone else that I get to talk to in urban sectors, how do you really think about your farmer? Do you really lie awake praying and hoping that your farmer will be as rich as you? And if you don't, you don't deserve decent food. Whoa. All right, but that's the truth. We only get what we value. That's the truth. And so we have to put our money where our mouth is. Let me ask you something, in case you're feeling a little bit down at this. We're going to talk about people that aren't here. No, those people out there, them, those, those people. Because I know that nobody in here buy, spends money on anything that you don't need. So can, so can you help me think of anything, anything that those people out there that aren't in here, those people, that they spend money on that they don't need anything? Come on. Is the translation this bad? <laughs> How about McDonald's? 
Tobacco. People Magazine. $100 designer jeans with holes already in the knees. I asked this at Georgetown University near Washington, D.C. You got to be stay away from Washington, D.C., trust me. I asked him that, and the guy yelled out from the row back there. He says, underwear! No, 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 you, you know. How about lottery tickets? Gambling. Bingo. DiGiorno's frozen pizza TV dinners. Netflix. Widescreen TVs. Smartphones. Yeah, you can live without a smartphone. I do. I got a dumb phone. All right. The point, the point is, folks, there is a lot of money out there. And every single one of us can find places where we can change five or six hundred dollars or a thousand dollars a year from discretionary income like cruises, vacations, and alcohol to a valued soil building, integrity food producing farmer. Okay. Number three, we want customers that love seasonality. Why do you have to have fresh strawberries in the middle of the winter? Eat the strawberries that you made into jam or froze back when they were in season. And when the next season rolls around and you can get fresh strawberries, celebrate it. This creates a spiritual understanding to our dependency on this ecological umbilical. You know, we've got this notion that we're so clever that we can just levitate into a cosmic nirvana and sever this mundane ecological umbilical into some Star Trek future. The fact is, the more we sense our connection, the more we will make decisions that honor that connection. That's the truth. And so we need to make decisions that honor that. The next thing is we want customers who love to help inventory problems. As a direct market farmer, we're desperate to move everything. Blemished tomatoes and perfect tomatoes. Sausage and pork chops. Crooked green beans and straight green beans. We've got to move it all. And what we desperately need are people that come up to us and say, do you have an oversupply of something? Let me help you use it. What happens is, you know, it's the end of tomato season. Um, and, and you ever notice how tomatoes talk a week before frost? All the tomatoes talk and they say, let's all double our production this week. The problem is, at that point of the year, everybody's tired of tomatoes. Well, that's when we need to cancel the Caribbean cruise and go buy all the local tomatoes and get in our techno glitzy kitchen and start the grinder and start the dehydrator and put this by for winter so we don't have to import tomatoes from warm climates floating on diesel fuel and cheap energy to get here when we're too negligent to take care of the abundance that nature wants to enjoy when the abundance is here and wants us to, to create a larder, a domestic larder, a nice pantry and supply of food, all right? So we need those people that want that inventory. We love people who come to us and say, hey, do you have a problem with chicken necks? I'll take them and make stock this week. Wow, you want to see us you know, slobber and hug and go crazy over a customer? That's the one that we go nuts over. And finally, we need customers who love for recreational and entertainment purposes to come and visit their farm treasures. The fact is that the local food movement is gaining momentum and everywhere around the world there are soil building, carbon centric, local centric, integrity food producers desperate for five more customers, 10 more customers. 
I can tell you visiting with thousands of these farmers around the world, many of whom are not good marketers. Ha. Farmers tend to not be good marketers. Well, then you come along and help them. Okay? And every place has wonderful farm food treasures in their community. You don't have to go every place you want to go. Just write in visiting five local farmers this year as part of your entertainment budget. And you will build a connection, a visceral understanding of how ecology works, farming works, how your, the food on your table works. And suddenly you will realize that you are privileged and honored to participate in the greatest earth healing remediation possible. And that's a great privilege. And I challenge us all tonight to make a commitment, make a point to participate, not abandon, not be scared, not be fearful, but actually to participate as an ally, as a lover in this abundant earth to restore integrity to our food, integrity to our table, and integrity to the community of beings inside us for which each of us is responsible for its food. That is what fuels us. That is what gives us health and vitality and gives us a great sense of awe, wonder, and respect to this wonderful choreography of life surrounding each of us. God help us to do it. Thank you for letting me visit with you. Blessings on all of you. Thank you very much. It's not fun. Thank you so much. That was uh, very inspiring and I think a very beautiful uh, uh, addition and keynote to this, uh, this fourth edition of the Food Film Festival. Um, I would like to take um, about 15 to 20 minutes to, ask, to answer a couple of questions um, um, from, the, from the people. Uh, and actually I want to also start with one question myself, which you probably um, really don't want to answer because everyone's ans asking it to you. And I read actually that you uh, already answered it a couple of times uh, during this uh, visit in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, but it's a question that uh, I would personally, and I think, well, it would be interesting to, to still hear your opinion about. Well, maybe, um, maybe my answer is changing. It, it might be, yeah. <laughs> and then we got it live on camera, so that would be nice. <laughs> um, so will your way of working, your way of farming, will that be able to uh, feed a growing world population? Oh, that's the funnest question in the world. Okay, let's deal with feed the world, all right? <clears throat> Can this feed the world? Is it just nice and cute and warm and fuzzy and spiritually, ah, <sighs> you know, but can it really feed the world? First of all, 50% of the human edible food in the world never gets eaten by a human. We have never thrown away so much food in the history of mankind. I find it fascinating that the earth has never had this many people in it and never thrown away so much food. Why do we throw it away? Because it spoils sitting in a warehouse, because it's the wrong shape. It has a little bug on it. It has a little blemish on it. It, 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 um, you know, it, it, it sits on a truck and can't get through a mountain pass. If you, could, if you could double the earth's food production today, not a single other stomach would get full. Nobody goes hungry because there's not enough food. They go hungry because of distribution problems, negligence, ignorance, socio-political issues like, you know, uh, 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 a gun-toting warlord that won't let a Red Cross truck, you know, pass a checkpoint. These are the sorts of things. One of the best things to help make that not happen so much is to shorten the length between field and fork. So that it doesn't sit in a warehouse for six months. So that, it, so that it has a short chain of custody. Number two, 
Right now, we have a fundamentally segregated food supply. It's produced over here, it's fertilized from over here, it's fed from over here, and then it's sold over here, eaten over here, and, and nothing is integrated. And so what we desperately need is to reintegrate our food supply. And yes, I'll go ahead and do my favorite part. That means urban chickens. You know, if every kitchen, if every kitchen in the country had enough chickens connected to it to eat the table scraps from that kitchen, there would not be an egg industry in the entire country. So all the factory farms and confinement chickens could be liberated to your kitchen. You, don't tell me you don't have room. Throw out the dog, throw out the cat, the gerbil, the snake, the parakeet. Put in two chickens, feed them your kitchen scraps, and they will not give you a hazardous substance to go in a bag to the landfill. They will give you two eggs for breakfast and poop that you can side dress your flowers with. So an integrated food system. Does your house have a southern exposure? Put a solarium on it. If we took all the diesel fuel spent in moving food and put that to, from, from unseasonal climates to seasonal, if we took all that diesel fuel and put it in solariums on the south side of houses, we could grow all our mescaline mix, lettuce, broccoli, and cabbage in the wintertime and wouldn't have to transport anything. See, I believe that petroleum was a bonanza, a windfall, a, 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 a blessing of a, 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 an unprecedented trophy blessing that was given right at a time that we could have used our big brain and opposing thumbs to heal and remediate in a generation all of the earth pillaging things that our ancestors have done. But instead of investing it that way, we built a global food system that now takes 15 calories of energy to put one calorie on a plate. As recently as 1930, it only took a quarter calorie of energy to put a calorie on your plate. That's a big difference. And so edible landscaping, living roofs, honeybees on your patio, Pot gardens on your, I mean, pot, uh, yeah. <laughs> pot, pot, like, like a pot. Well, you can do the other pot, too. It suits me fine. But pot gardens on our patios, okay, that sort of thing. Finally, the last part of the thing is this. You have to understand that the people who poo-poo what I've shown you here as being credible are steeped in the notion that if we hadn't had the green revolution with chemicals, half of the world would not be here. What people don't understand is that in 1900, we were in a similar civil situation, and all of the, the, the farm, you know, the food farm experts in the world were scared to death that we would starve. We had early urbanization, we had, you know, we had a burgeoning population, and Urban centers were starting to, you know, to get bigger, and the cities were being covered up in poop. We had the Dust Bowl in the U.S. We had, we had, uh, uh, there, there was, by 1900, there were no new worlds. New Zealand was populated. Australia was populated. We, in America, we had gone all the way to the Pacific by that time. There were no new worlds. Where are we going to go? We're going to all starve to death. And there were two schools of thought as to how to solve the problem. One school was an outgrowth of Justice von Liebig, the Austrian chemist, who in 1837 brought to the world the notion that all of life is just a rearrangement of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, the chemical-mechanical approach to life. The other thread was led by the naturalists, by the, by the romantic English poets, by, you know, by the philosophers. And, 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 and their darling ended up being an Englishman by the name of Sir Albert Howard, who spent his life from 1910 to 1940 in indoor India developing scientific aerobic compost. Well, <clears throat> he brought that to the world in 1943. The world was preoccupied in 1943. 
All of us were preoccupied in 1943. Interestingly, N, P, and K are the foundation of something else. You know what that is? Ammunition. Explosives. That was in high demand in 1943. And so the war effort paid for the, for the, the scientific knowledge, the laboratories, the distribution, the mining, and the, 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 the corporate uh, growth of chemical NP and K. So now it's 1946. The war is over. You're a farmer. How do you fertilize these fields? Do you do Sir Albert Howard's aerobic composting method? In a time before PTO-powered manure spreaders, front-end loaders, black plastic pipe, easy concrete, rural electrification, People were tired of shoveling. They didn't want to shovel anymore. They'd been shoveling poop forever. All farmers did was shovel, 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 shovel. They didn't want to shovel. And so they reached for the bag. So don't be too hard on great grandpa. He was tired of shoveling. And he took the bag. All right? But it. But that bag was subsidized by the war effort. Are you with me? And it took another 15 years for the other side to develop the infrastructure to metabolize Sir Albert Howard's gift of aerobic compost, of scientific aerobic composting. So by the mid-1950s, I'm done forgiving. Now you ought to join the, 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 the right side. The fact is, and now, of course, now we've got, goodness, we've got, we've got, little diesel tractors and front-end loaders and chippers and rural electrification and water pipes and piggerators and electric fence and all an amazing array of, of high-tech infrastructure and things that allow us to leverage scientific aerobic composting like never before. The fact is, gentle people, that if we had had a Manhattan Project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done it without three-legged salamanders, infertile frogs, and a dead zone the size of New Jersey in the Gulf of Mexico. That's the truth. And it's taken our side a while to build up to the other. But the other side, the chemical side, has populated our universities, our politics, our regulators, and the minds of all those people out there that didn't come in here tonight. And that's a big ship to turn around. If we actually embraced what I showed you, it would completely invert the power, position, profits, and prestige of the entire food and farming industry. And that is a lot of inertia. So we have an uphill battle. But can we feed the world? Not only can we, we're the only system that can do it regeneratively on the planet. They just don't know it yet. I'm glad we have that on tape now. Um, <laughs> considering the length of your answers, <laughs> I will start <laughs> taking three questions three and questions. I will see where we are, but I guess we'll probably be in time. And I yep. got. Uh, well, I'm one, glad two, you're the bad guy. Three, and then we have you as a bonus. Uh, and I want to start here. Okay. Uh, and please uh, say it to me and then I'll. Re uh, I'll, I'll re um, all the answers won't be that long, I don't think. <laughs> okay. And I'll uh, say the, uh, the question again. So you mentioned that um, water is the thing that actually brings your budget up for like the budget that you have for the budget that you have for the budget that you have for for the uh, the San Andreas Fault is probably a good place to start. Yeah, it's going to fall off into the no ocean. You know that, don't you? It's, it's going to fall apart. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, water in California. The 
there, there are a couple of threads here, and I'll answer this quickly. First of all, organic matter. You know what organic matter is? I mean, like compost, like, like, like decaying leaves, okay? Organic matter, one pound of it holds four pounds of water. One pound of it holds four pounds of water. And in California, as well as Australia, and all sorts of places in the world, what was 400 years ago, somewhere between 6 and 10% organic matter, is now 1% organic matter. Because tillage, tillage destroys organic matter. See, you all are really jaundiced in the way you look at ecology because not everybody, not every place is as forgiving as the Netherlands. You know, misty, moisty mornings and foggy weather and, and you know, it's, every place is not like that. And so the desperate need is to build organic matter. How do you build organic matter? You build it with perennials, not annuals. And so California, 400 years ago, was a savanna of large herbivores, wolves, occasional fire started by the natives to beat the brush back, but a very active perennial Tree, um, uh, tree cycled, um, high organic matter place. It's now down to less than one percent. So, so perennial. Uh, uh, okay, you got meerjarig. Perennial is okay, meerjarig. Okay. So, so, um, so if California would move to a more perennial system and build organic matter, and that would involve cutting mature trees to make room for young trees, which are more aggressive at converting solar energy into carbon, and, and converting those, that old biomass, into compost to build soil, you'd have more water retentive capacity, springs would begin again, and there would simply be more water. Um, the, the second thing, would be to eliminate the flush toilet, okay, uh, and go to gray water return systems and catchment systems, cisterns. Every building should have a cistern next to it. You go to Australia, you go to the urban areas of Australia, every house has a five, five to 10,000 gallon cistern next to it. They run off of their roof water. Well, California could do the same thing. You don't have to ship it in from Colorado. You just collect your own water, okay? So there are a lot of things that California could do. And California could quit trying to feed the world if every community of the world fed itself and California quit shipping alfalfa using, using depleting aquifer water to feed cows in Japan and pigs in the Netherlands, you know, we could... California would be water sufficient and not have a problem. Then California could feed itself and everybody else could feed themselves. Ultimately, food and water security starts by changing from the inside out, not the outside in. It can never be fixed by bringing in from outside. It has to start from the inside and work out. Okay, next question. Yes. Now yeah, the question is, well, let me do the let me do it backwards. Is exporting sustainable? Well, I'm not a I don't think it's sinful to export and import anything. But if I had a business dependent on cheap energy and pharmaceuticals and animal abuse, I wouldn't want to invest in it. And I've been here now for a week and I have smelled a lot of poop. A lot of poop, all right? The fact is that if a system is soiling its nest, that's not building soil, 
but soiling its nest, no matter what it possibly could do, that's not the answer. I mean, you can't live sustainably making a mess out of your nest, okay? You can't do it. And so, ultimately, communities have to figure out how to feed themselves. It was interesting, I was, um, I was at Terra Madre in Turin, Italy a few years ago speaking. When I wasn't speaking, I made a point to visit every single African delegation. If you're not familiar with this, this is the, the, uh, globe, the, the, the planet gathering of Slow Food organized by uh, Carlo Petrini, the founder of Slow Food. And so, uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I, I went to all the African delegations I could. And every single African delegation, it was interesting, I spent most of my time in, uh, you know, apologizing for U.S. policy, distancing myself from our official orthodoxy. And I went to every African delegation and found every African delegation embarrassed about their government's policy taking Western dumping, and every single one of them said, if you Westerners would leave us alone, we've got the people, the capital, the knowledge, and the resources to feed ourselves. But when you come in with foreign aid and subsidized products and displace our indigenous foodscape systems, it disempowers our people, depresses our culture, and destroys our indigenous value. Every single one of them. I mean, my lights were just going off, you know, bang, bang, bang. You, know, you, you, just, you just can't believe this. And, and, and that's the official position. So I really believe, I really believe that people can feed themselves. I don't think we're that stupid. We can figure out how to feed ourselves. And if, and if feeding China turns the Netherlands into a toilet, that's not a valuable export. Okay. Now, the first question was, help me. Oh, how do you deal with the legal system? Oh, my, the legal system. Well, when a bureaucrat shows up, I just uh, hang them. <laughs> um, those of you who have seen my book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, uh, know that I have a pretty libertarian bent. So, here's the deal. What's happening in the Western world, the sophisticated Western world, is an increasing orthodoxy of food. I've just been a week in, in the Netherlands, and I'm hearing that the kind of things you saw with multi-speciation are borderline illegal. The EU doesn't want to see two kinds of species because they might get diseased. In the U.S., we're trying to outlaw animals and animals human edible plants on the same farm. You know, we've got language now to outlaw uh, 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 3,000 bird outdoor flocks of chickens. The government now doesn't talk about your cow or, or, or your tomato. Your tomato is now part of the national produce, uh, um, whatever, produce, produce. Your cow is part of the national herd. Your chicken is part of the national flock. And what we're seeing is categorically um, increasing pressure from the orthodoxy, from the status quo to, um, to protect itself from lunatics like me. Because we are chipping away at market share. More and more people are mistrusting Monsanto. Syngenta, Aventus, name your, you know, name your poison. More and more people are realizing, uh, I don't think those guys have my best interests at heart. And as people jump off of that ship, they're coming to integrity farmers. And the industry doesn't like losing market share. And so it will demonize, marginalize, and criminalize all of the innovative innovative uh, uh, um, ideas that we have to go back to an ecologically centric thing. So what I'm pushing in the U.S., and there's a growing movement for this, is essentially a two-tier system. That if you are scared of food 
and you are paranoid and you want a government approval on your food to make sure that all your milk is pasteurized and your and your green beans were grown in chemical fertilizer and your and your and your pork was properly vaccinated and 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 drugged if that's what you want fine okay but if you want as a consenting adult to voluntarily take charge of your food choices and buy the food of your choice from the source of your choice, you should be able to do that with the farmer of your choice without a bureaucrat getting in between you. And that would be a two-tier system. And if we offered that, you would see, and if you offered it here, you would see an explosion of local, artisanal, cottage-based, integrity food production like you've never seen in the past. That would bring the price of local, high-quality food way down, and it would flood the market with an antidote to all the things that people are afraid of. That's the truth. And so somehow, if we're going to live in an innovative, loving society, we have to preserve a place of a, a place for neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor commerce free of a bureaucrat getting in, in between that. That's ultimately where we have. Otherwise, we don't let innovation go. See, innovation starts embryonically with a very small prototype. If the government says you have to have a a $10,000 piece of infrastructure, stainless steel, refrigerator, whatever, to start with one bucket of trial cheese or charcuterie or below, are, are you with me? You can't start because the embryo is too big to be birthed. And so the food safety regulatory system, which is prejudicial against small scale, denies you and I the ability to access the creativeness and integrity of our neighbor food system. And that is tyranny. That is tyranny. Let's take uh, one last question over there, unfortunately, because of the time. Um, one last. One last. What was the last one? Oh, meat from animals? Oh, methane from animals. Oh, okay. Um, how do, okay, uh, there's a couple threads in that, in that question. Efficiency, labor, that sort of thing. You know, um, <clears throat> this is the best jobs program ever invented. You know, why is it that we think that we can have good food when we have fewer eyes and ears and hands involved with it. I'm with Wendell Berry. If we're going to love the land well, we must know the land well. And you can't know but so much land. And so we need more people knowing the land. I don't apologize that this puts more labor on the farm. You know what it does? This disemploys the pharmaceutical industry. It disemploys the hospitals. It disemploys the healthcare centers. It disemploys the chemical companies. It disemploys the petroleum companies. And all those people can become farmers. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, that deals with the labor and the efficiency, I hope. Now, let's talk about the methane. Oh my, methane. Did you know, did you know that when biomass decomposes, let's say you have a, a grass plant, when biomass decomposes, it gives off the same methane as if it's digested in the rumen of a cow. There's no difference. And when a cow eats it, she makes, she synergizes it into urine and manure and grows more grass 
which pulls methane out of the air. The problem with this is that there's an agenda, again, an orthodoxy based on grain-based herbivores and feedlots and global markets. If we, if we go to local-centric, grass-based herbivore production, we actually sequester more carbon. Listen, if everybody did this in, on our farm in, 40 year, in 50 years, we have gone from 1% to 8% organic matter. All we have to do is go one percentage in organic matter in the farmland of the world, and, in, and, in, and that would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. But see, to do it this way puts money in farmers' pockets. And that's not where research scientists and the EU and the UN and the US, duh, want the money to go. They want it to go to their crony of fraternities. They're, you know, they've all drunk the Kool-Aid. And they want to disempower farmers and have the urban sector get more wealthy and the rural sector get impoverished. And that is done when we eliminate animals. You need to understand something else too. One of the values of animals. So, so, so all the studies and all the hype about methane are all based on an incorrect production model. And if you go to this, you actually sequester way more than you produce. It's not a zero-sum thing. Yes, there's some produced, but you're growing because of the pruning and the mob stocking and you know, all that. You're actually producing more carbon sequestration than any belching. And remember, the plant decomposing produces the same methane as it does in the stomach of a cow, but without the benefits of the cow. Finally, it's important to understand one of the roles of animals is that they offer real-time nutrition. One of the reasons that all poor cultures in the world depend on animals is because that is nutrition that is portable and doesn't need to be refrigerated. I find it fascinating that so many people want to demonize animals when for a poor nomad, an anti-animal theme in thinking is absolutely the most hateful thought to impoverished people you can imagine. Because what do you do when some wealthy European or American comes in and displaces a poor African family that has three goats and four, sh and four little sheep and that's all they have? And no refrigerator, no electricity, no running water. Those animals can move with the displaced family and provide a lifeblood of nutrition for them. So an animal-centric globe, an animal-centric world is fundamental not only for biological uh, sequestration through uh, pruning under historical methods, it's also the salvation of poor people around the globe who can't have refrigerators, automobiles, and electricity and are desperate for a food system that is dense and portable in real time. So we honor, we honor our impoverished foreign friends by encouraging them to have a couple lambs and a couple goats and a cow. That honors the needs of these people that aren't as sophisticated as we are. And I would suggest that that is a better sacred place to be, to honor those people and their needs. I think we're done, so let me bless you before you go. May all of your carrots be long and straight. May your gardens be productive and cover your houses with lush foliage. May your radishes be large but not pithy. And your tomatoes be free of blossom end rot. May your backyard chickens be productive and enjoy your potato peels. May your culinary experiments be delectably palatable. May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise and call you blessed, and may we all make our nest 
a better place than we inherited. Thank you very much for letting me visit with you. Blessings on all. Thank you. Mr. Joe Salatin, thank you so much. I would like now like to uh, invite, um, because this is the, f the, the, the official end of the Food Film Festival, the fourth edition of the Food Film Festival, and I would like to invite uh, the co-founder and the chairman of the uh, foundation of Food Film Festival to the stage, Helen Kranstaber. Thank you so much for this really inspiring and powerful speech. I think we couldn't think of a better end of this festival. And that has been a ride. It has been three great days of Food Film Festival here in Amsterdam on a new location on which we feel already at home very much. I'm also really tired, so Forgive me making any mistakes. I want to start, I want to thank, actually, and I want you to help me with that, to give a big, big thank you to the whole Food Film Festival team, because they have been working for the last months, they have been working so hard, and these last days, they have been working so hard. All the chefs, and I think they're even still working in the kitchen, you can see them right there, they're still working in the film venues, still working uh, uh, behind the computers, making the website look great and look, make it look fantastic. I want you to help me give them a big applause and make them hear the applause around the whole <laughs> location. Because this is really a team effort and we also need you, our audience, to help us build this festival year and year again. This is now the fourth edition and I got a bit inspired by, uh, by Joel, your speech about soil. I think that's what we are really trying to do with the Food Film Festival and, and the broader food movement. We're trying to make that soil and make it healthy, uh, make it powerful, make it strong, and this soil is actually all you guys here, sitting here this night, today, and even more people in, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, all over the world, more and more people getting aware of food issues, on sustainability, uh, and about their interaction in this system. So, I'm seeing this soil getting more and more healthy every year, and I'm not sure what's going to grow out of it, but I think it's going to be something pretty amazing. So I want to thank you for that, being part of this healthy soil. Thank you so much. <laughs> and for now, one more thing. <laughs> I'm looking forward to go home, to go back to the kitchen, to to go start cooking with my daughter and maybe give her a chicken on the balcony someday. And I want you to do the same. Go back to your homes and buy good food. Go back to the kitchen and please share your experiences here and share the story of the Food Film Festival with all the others on, the, on your dining table. Thank you so much. See you next year. So thank you for coming to this keynote. Thank you for coming for the, to the Food Film Festival. Everything has been said. I just wanted to add that I'm very, very proud to be here today and to be part of this amazing movement that we are part of as a Food Film Festival, but it's way broader and it's really an adventure to, uh, to be part of this. One final thing, uh, the bar here will be closed. Um, so if you want to have a drink, go to the Ketelhuis, which will still be open until 12-ish.
12 ish. One ish. So uh, that's down the street on the left, on your left side. Uh, thank you and see you next year. Shut up, combine it. Where you your business? You know, get today. You go be a no ish constipate.